UFOs and ETs in the Bible? Interesting question. Uh, it, we got to define our terms right. a little bit, I think, right? So, uh, in as far as there were sons of God coming down, there were demons coming down, then yes, there are aliens, because the demons of yesterday are today's aliens. That's really the bottom line. Uh, there are not aliens from some distant galaxy or from the Pleiades system or anything like that. They are very much from here. They're demonic. And so, in as far as there were demons, then, then yes. Now, this is, this is the four main examples of UFOs. <laughs> the one on the upper left is the classic gray alien. These are described as being three or four feet tall. They walk in a kind of a robot-like or monkey-like fashion. They smell of sulfur. They, uh, although they walk around for the most part naked, they don't appear to have any genitalia. Uh, they communicate by telepathy and their eyes are really, really, really scary. Um, they also don't appear to eat or reproduce. What they do is they, they stick their long, very long, tenderly fingers into either blood or chlorophyll and suck nutrients through their fingertips. That's the only way they eat. And they apparently do not do anything to eliminate it, which might explain why they smell so bad. Uh, anyhow, and these are the ones that are usually involved in the UFO abductions. They're most often described as being there as, as workers. The second type are called the Nordics or the Blondes. And these are impossibly beautiful men and women, usually quite tall, not abnormally so, but you know, like supermodel height in the case of the women and six foot one or two in the case of the men, that look like Nordic gods. They look totally like regular human beings, except much better looking than most of us. And these are supposedly from the constellation Lyra. I forgot to tell you, the gray guys are supposedly from the constellation Zeta Reticuli. Now the Nordics are supposedly the good guys. They like us. They're fighting for us against the bad guys if we're intended to believe all this, okay. Then the third variety, we're not really sure what these things are, if they're aliens or not, they're called the Men in Black. And they have nothing to do with that couple of crazy movies that came out the last few years with Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, these are very strange dudes. They appear more normally to be Asian. Uh, they walk around wearing dark glasses, black suits, and Hamburg hats. They drive very old black Cadillacs. And they smell of electricity, ozone, and sulfur. They walk around like robots. And their voices are metallic. And what they appear, their function appears to be is that if someone starts talking about having a UFO experience of whatever sort, they, um, they will come around and try and intimidate the person and say, you don't want to do that, you might get in, you know, you don't want to do that, you might get in trouble with the government, you know, stuff like that. And, and they, they, they act very strange. Nobody really knows what they are. I mean, they could be robots, they could be aliens, they could be CIA agents on qualudes. I mean, nobody knows, you know, but they don't normally walk around carrying ray guns like that either. Uh, then the fourth kind, which is the really scary ones, are the reptilians. And no, that's not a photograph of a reptilian. I took that from Jurassic Park. But the reptilians are described as between six and a half and seven feet tall and very much looking like velociraptors, except they wear suits or they wear lab coats. They dress perfectly normal, except they have a tail and they are scaly and green and tall and have a head like that. These guys are carnivorous. They prefer live food, i.e. human beings, and just like a reptile prefers live food. And um, supposedly they have the ability to transform themselves for brief periods into humanoid shapes. They can appear to be humans for brief periods, you know, a few hours, and then they have to go back to their normal shape except for their eyes. Their eyes look reptilian, unless they wear special contact lenses, or unless they wear dark glasses. So, you know, I mean, all I know is they, they, these things are out there. They've been sighted on numerous occasions by numerous people, including me. Uh, they were even sighted in a shopping mall in Salt Lake City. 
after hours. There's all sorts of stuff that goes on underneath Salt Lake City that you don't want to know about. But this was in the basement of the Zion Cooperative Mercantile Exchange Mall. And a cleaning lady was cleaning and all of a sudden you walked around a corner and she said there was this seven foot tall lizard standing there in a lab coat with a clipboard. And he was as astonished to see her as she was to see him. She shrieked and ran one way and he went back and ran the other way. And uh, so, and, and, and several people have alleged seeing reptiles in the deepest levels of the Mormon temple. Because the Mormon temple goes many, in Salt Lake goes many layers deep. But the point is, these reptilian types never really ran in, were run into until a certain key moment in UFO history. Well, what's actually happening here? Well, first of all, according to the Bible, there's seven kinds of beings here on earth. There's Yahweh, who of course is the Almighty God. There are higher level celestial beings, you know, what are spoken of in various parts of the Bible, seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, six, Ephesians 6.12. And of course, some of them are good and some of them are fallen. Then there's angels, both elect angels that are good and evil angels. Then there's humans. Then there's these mysterious giants that are spoken of in Genesis 6, also called Nephilim. Then there's demons, and then finally, of course, there's the animal kingdom. Now, some of you might be surprised we have two separate categories for angels and demons. Because some people believe, erroneously, I think, that demons are fallen angels. I don't think the Bible supports that. I think that's a, something that somehow developed over the years in the Dark Ages, because I've encountered demons and I've encountered fallen angels. And uh, there's as much difference between a fallen angel as a demon as there's between me and a mosquito. Fallen angels are awesome beings and demons are not. Demons are like insects basically, except they're spiritual. I'm not saying they're really zzz, little thing buzzing around. And remember, nowhere in the scriptures do we ever hear of someone being possessed with a fallen angel. They're always possessed with a devil or a demon, whatever. So I believe that angels that are fallen are just that, fallen angels. They're not demons. Well, then the question becomes, well, where do the demons come from? Now, sinned against the animals is a reference to genetic manipulation, which created the animal-human hybrids of mythology. We talked about that in a previous session, which appears to have made a way for the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim to have host bodies to once again inhabit thus bringing about the return. What am I talking about? I have to clarify something first. There's a difference between fallen angels and demons. A lot of people think fallen angels and demons are one or the same. They're not. Angels are, first of all, fallen angels are just regular angels that rebelled. I mean, there's not, physically there's nothing different from the other angels. They were just rebellious. Uh, they get around just fine with the bodies that they have, right? But demons are always looking for a body to get into, right? Well, Enoch tells you where demons come from. When you kill a Nephilim, the offspring of angels mating with humans, their spirit leaves their body because it was never meant to exist in the first place and becomes a wandering evil spirit called a demon. Demons are disembodied spirits of dead Nephilim. That's where demons come from. Now, so when you create something like this, I believe, you know, when Scripture says everything must reproduce after its own kind, right? When it's, Scripture says that God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul, the word soul there is nephesh. It's the same word used elsewhere where it says the living creatures, when he created the living creatures, nefesh. I believe there, that's the life force that God puts into embryos, you know, at the moment of conception. I believe there is a God-prescribed nefesh for each kind. That's why God said everything must reproduce after what? Its own kind. So there's a God-prescribed nefesh for a bird, for a cat, for a dog, a horse, human. God-prescribed nefesh for each different time, each different kind. Right? And they're not supposed to be blended together. So I wondered, well, what if you blend a human and a goat? You don't have a God-prescribed nefesh to go into it, do you? Because they're two different kinds. So what did you do? I think all you did is create a host body that's fit for another spirit nefesh to go into.